Our study this morning is in Isaiah chapter 53, so if you will, uh, or I'm sorry, 63, Isaiah 63, if you will open there, and I think we're going to see some very interesting things in, in this chapter. I haven't done this in a while, but let's begin with a prayer. Will you bow with me? Dear Father, we bow with humility before you. We thank you for another day that you've given us and the blessings of this day. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the sunshine as well, uh, and that you are sovereign over our, our world. We are thankful for everyone who's here this morning, and we are here gathered together, Father, to hear your word. And we're gathered together to bring praise and honor and glory to your name. Thank you for this wonderful, majestic book of Isaiah and for the truths that are here and the truths that are revealed to us about you, about your holiness, also about your wrath and about your love and sending Christ to be our Savior. And we're thankful for his death on the cross and we pray every day that we live that we will grow to appreciate more and more what was done for us there in the atoning death of Christ. And this will be our song throughout eternity as we, as we praise you for uh, the Lamb and for what was done and as we worship the Lamb. We're thankful, Father, that he did not remain in the grave, but he's been raised to live forevermore in the hope that we have of living with you. Father, we are longing for the time when all things will be made new and there will be no sin, no sickness, no death, no suffering, and we will behold your face around the throne as we join in, in our hearts together in fellowship, bringing praise and glory to you throughout eternity. Forgive us of our sins. Go with us. Help us to have ears to hear this chapter here in Isaiah. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. What I want to do is begin Isaiah chapter 63, and I want us to look at verses 7 and following, and then we're going to jump back to the beginning of the chapter. And I just want to point out some things in 7 and following, really 7 through 14, and then we'll come back and we'll see that in more detail. Uh, this chapter is about the uh, vengeance, the wrath of God, but also the redemption of of God in this one who's coming as, as Isaiah sees he sees him far off he's coming and then he comes and he asks the question who is this one so in chapter 63 7 through 14 we have um, really and it goes into chapter 64 verse 6 these what some have called the laments of Isaiah two sections here then are Isaiah 63 7 through 14 and then Isaiah 63 15 into chapter 64 and verse 6. And in this section, Isaiah is remembering or reminiscing and listing the mercies of God that God has shown to his, to his people. In the second section, 63, 15 into chapter 64, it's made up of petitions, of cries to God to hear, to, to listen. And the final cry is, uh, it's in the Hebrew, uh, the last verse, chapter 63, but in the English, it's the first verse, chapter 64. And it is uh, something really amazing. Oh, that you would tear the heavens and come down. And I'm going to kind of hold that because we're going to see at the end of this, God did tear the heavens and God did come down. So it's, it's pleading, but we'll come back to that. Somebody else outlined this chapter this way, that somebody is coming. Someone is coming. Who is it that's robed in splendor, that, that, that's coming? Uh, this watchman sees somebody coming. Well, who is it? Well, here's then the outline of the chapter is in verses 1 through 6, that one who is coming, who's robed in splendor, is righteous and the mighty Savior. So who's coming? He's the righteous, mighty Savior. And that's verses 1 through 6. And we're going to come back to these as we work our way through it. This is kind of a preview. Then who is coming? In verses 7 through 14, the one who is coming, which is the same individual, 
is a compassionate or caring, kind Savior. So not only is the one who, come, who is coming righteous, mighty Savior in strength, but the one who is coming is a compassionate, kind Savior that Isaiah sees. Then the third section in the chapter, in this outline, who is coming? It's the one who is zealous and a mighty redeemer. And that's verses 15 through 19. So let's back up and go back to the beginning of the chapter. Who is coming? Who is it? Well, it's a righteous, mighty Savior. And that's verses 1 through 6. Let's read that together. I'm reading from the NIV. Who is this coming from Edom or Edom? From Bozrah with his garments stained crimson. Who is this? Robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength. It is I proclaiming victory mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone from the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. It was for me the day of vengeance. The year for me to redeem has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. Some very vivid pictures there, isn't it? About who is coming. Well, the one who's coming is righteous and a mighty Savior. So the watchman cries out to this warrior that he sees. And I guess the watchman here is, is Isaiah, the prophet. But he cries out to a warrior that he sees who's, who's drenched in blood. Who is he? And the warrior is the Messiah. And he's personally defeated all the world powers, all the powers against God and against him. And he's come to save his people. So there has to be that defeat, that vengeance, that wrath that's tied in with salvation, with, with redemption. I mean, and that's always so. I mean, the last enemy to be defeated will be death. And so for us to be redeemed, for us to be uh, saved, God defeats the enemies as well. Those two go together. God's wrath and vengeance and God's salvation. This passage here, um, when he, I mean, it's back and forth. I mean, he says, who is that coming? And then he answers, the, the, the one answers. And he says, it is I. And then you have the question again. Why is your apparel red? Why are your clothing red in your garments like you've been treading in a wine press? You tread in a wine press, it's going to splatter all over your clothes, and you come out of there and it's stained. Everything. That's what he looked like, he said. And um, if you don't know, this is the basis for the, the uh, song Battle Hymn of the Republic. He's trampling out the grapes of, of, of wrath. And notice it begins here, who is this coming? And he's coming from Ad Adom or Edom. Why is he coming from Edom? Uh, some have suggested that the idea here is, um, it, you have the word Adam or Adam, A-D-A-M, and that's the general term for humans. That's also related to Adama, which is the ground, so Adam, Adam, comes from Adama, the ground. It's related to Edom. It's related to the word Dom, D-A-M, which means blood or blood colored. And so all those things are related together. Esau's name is Edom or Edom. And you remember when you go back and study about Esau and he's tied in with red and hairy. So he's coming from Edom, but a lot of scholars think that this is saying that he is coming from all people in a sense and his vengeance is upon all people anyone who doesn't listen to God there's this idea 
in uh, the New Testament, in chapter 19 and verse 15, the same thing here, that there is the, the, the one who's sitting on a white horse, John sees. And the one sitting on that, right, on that white horse has coming out of his mouth a sharp sword. And it's that sharp sword is that he may strike down the nations or all people, those who are opposed to him and to God. And he'll rule them with a rod of iron. And it says he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. That's the same thought that we have here in Isaiah 63. Now, as I mentioned, these two things go together, vengeance and redemption. In our day, a lot of people, many people, cannot conceive of a God of love taking vengeance. A God of love, just in the minds of a lot of people, cannot be a God of wrath. The God of love, picture of the God of love, is a picture, it's a nice picture, we want to hang that in the living room, everybody comes in and sees the picture of God as God of love. And then somebody said, well, God has got a wrath as well, so uh, we hang that, if it's true, if I can even conceive of that, we put that down a darkened hallway. Yet, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament as well, both of those are held in balance. Both of those must be true. God is a God of vengeance, or a God of wrath, and a God of redemption, a God of love, a God of, of salvation. And he does that by sending his own son, by sending Messiah, the anointed one, who takes God's wrath upon himself, the wrath we deserve, and provides then salvation for us. Now, if we say, no thanks, I, I, I don't want that, I don't want someone to die for me, then we take that wrath upon ourselves. But both testaments are, are, are clear that the idea of the God of vengeance is also the same God who's a God of love. And that's what we see here. So verses 1 through 6 is this idea of one who is coming who is mighty. One who is, who is righteous. So who is, who is he coming? Uh, in fact, uh, Bozrah there in verse 1 uh, some uh, that's a little unclear. Somebody, uh, uh, some scholars want to tie that into the Hebrew root batsir, which means vintage, and so it's tied in the cutting of the grapes. I don't know about that. It may be some location, but he's coming. It's warriors coming, and he sees him, and he's stately. He has this great strength. He's glorious. Even the word glorious there has been suggested. It's tied to a root that means. Um, puffed if, if somebody's moving very fast and they have a, a like a robe they're wearing a robe and they're moving fast the wind gets under that and it just puffs up the garment and so he is coming and he's coming deliberately and he is coming in rapid movement it's almost like his garment is just puffed up and he answers who's that coming he says i and i speak in in victory i'm mighty to save and then Isaiah says, why are your garments red? Like you've been trampling in, in a wine press. And he says, I have been trampling in a wine press. And so it's figurative uh, teaching here. Alone, and I trod the nations in my anger. And in verse 4, this day of vengeance, as we said, is also this year of redemption. That's probably the same year that we saw earlier, the year of God's, of God's favor. And he says, nobody else can do this work. This is the work that I do. And so my own arm brings this salvation. And I trod them down in my anger, he says. Now the second section, who's coming, and this one who is coming is a compassionate, kind Savior. And as we said, this section is in a lament. Um, it's... The, the structure is like some of the laments in the book of Psalms. Like, and we have a whole book of laments in the Hebrew Scriptures called Lamentations. And it's, it's a lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was like a war zone. It's just destroyed. And so we don't know who wrote it. Tradition says Jeremiah wrote it. But you have Lamentations. It's also a poem in Hebrew, an acrostic. But it begins with the very first word, Eka. And Eka means how. How? 
And it could be, a qu probably not, but it could be a question, how? How'd this happen? Or it could be an exclamation, how lonely the city sits, like, like a widow. So you have lamentations. Well, what we, the language we have here is very close to that. And the bloody image of this warrior coming now is balanced by the image of a compassionate shepherd. He's compassionate. He's, he's a kind shepherd. And so let's read this. This is Isaiah 63, and we'll read verses 7 through 14. I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he's done for Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Then his people recalled the days of old, the days of Moses and his people, where, where is he who brought them through the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them, who sent his glorious arm of power to be at Moses' right hand, who divided the waters before them, to gain for himself everlasting renown, who led them through the depths like a horse in open country they did not stumble, like cattle they go down to the plain. They were given rest by the Spirit of the Lord. This is how you guided your people to make for yourself a glorious name. And so the one who's coming is like a shepherd. He's compassionate, leading the people. And Isaiah goes back through the history of the nation. You led them, you divided the sea, you, you carried them through on dry land. You have Moses, this great uh, leader. And so there's gratitude to God. Then look at verse 10. But they rebel. And the Hebrew is emphatic there. In spite of everything that God did, they rebelled. It's, it's almost inconceivable. How can that, can that happen? And then he's calling God, remember what you did. Remember the kindness that you did. That's characteristic of laments uh, in, in Scripture. And he breaks out in praise to God for his kindness, for his, his loving mercy. And God punishes. God punishes. Notice his people just as quickly as he saves them. And so this is lamenting. Who's coming is compassionate, kind Savior. Then the third section, who's coming, is in verses 15 through 19, he is a zealous, mighty redeemer. So let's read this section. So this is Isaiah 63, 15 through the end of the chapter. Look down from heaven and see from your lofty throne, holy and glorious, where are your zeal and your might, your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us. But you are our father, though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us. You, Lord, are our father, our redeemer from of old is your name. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? That's strange. We'll come back to that in a second. Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are your inheritance. For a little while, your people possessed your holy place, but now our enemies have trampled down your sanctuary. We are yours from of old, but you've not ruled over them. They have not been called by your name. So he is, in this third section, a zealous, mighty redeemer. Why is God, act, he says, why have you acted so long to act on, on your behalf? Um, we still sin, but why? And so this is right at the heart of this lament. Even in times of unrest, pain, brokenness, for many modern Christians, I think, the, the practice of 
corporate lament. It's expressing to God a lament, the pain that we have. That might be for some to be just too emotional, too depressing, maybe not even appropriate. Yet it's, it has a wonderful history in Scripture of lamenting, and it's begging God to act and to act the way that you used to act. It's recognizing the way things are and things are not right in our world and it's coming to God and we're not right. And it's saying to God, please act. So it's like an abrupt turn here in this section. After the triumph, the victory of the opening, who's coming? He's coming and he's this mighty warrior. The, the watchman now sees that things are not right. Even you've turned against us. And he's lamenting your, the, the, our enemies are surrounding us. Now, you defeated our enemies, and we're back in the land and all that. And why would you think? I mean, why, why lament? God arranged that they're released from Babylon, Babylon slavery. God arranged for Cyrus the Great to provide their way back, even funding some of the building the, the temple and, and the walls in Jerusalem. Why lament? Because the whole return is painful and still they're struggling with this, with this sin, with this sin problem. And they ask the question, and we saw this last week, is the Lord powerless? Is the Lord faithful? It, has He given up on us? And you have Isaiah and the other prophets say, He is faithful, He hasn't given up on us. And so He's begging God, it, because he says, I look now, it doesn't seem like you're the same God you were earlier in what you did. But again, the problem is with them. Look at, uh, as I mentioned there, in verse 17, he says, Why do you make us to wander or err from our ways and harden our hearts from you? What? I mean, what? Why do you make us wander? Is God making them wander? Is God hardening their hearts that they can't turn? I mean, who rebelled? It's Israel, isn't it? It's not God. I mean, it's who, who walked out the door? It's Israel. Israel turned their back on God. So, again, this characteristic of laments, it's not just cataloging facts. It's unburdening pain. It's, it's being honest with God. It's saying, okay, well... Please turn back to us. It, it's prayer in a sense. One person said, I think this is Raymond Ortland in a commentary, and, and I think I want to deal with this a little bit more in chapter 64 because it's still the lament in the prayer. But he, he, uh, Ortland says, Isaiah is teaching us how to pray. We don't learn to pray by listening to one another. We learn to pray by reading the Bible. God tells us how to approach him and it's with honesty that we approach him and so there's this petition this this lamenting now look at uh, 64 1 and this is the last verse of chapter 63 and this is really wonderful and I kind of want to I guess make this a bridge into our next lesson in Isaiah but Isaiah 64 1 Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. That's the desire. You rip the heavens and come down. Now, in Mark's gospel, interesting thing, there are two tearings or rendings, one at the beginning of the gospel and one at the end of the gospel. Mark 1 and verse 10 is the beginning of the gospel. Go over there real quick. Mark 1 and verse 10 tells us, Jesus came to Nazareth in Galilee. He's baptized by John the Baptist in the, in the Jordan River. And so verse 10, Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven, and the NIV here has being torn apart opened up, it's being torn, it's, it's the word schizo in Greek, and so it's, it's a, a pretty vigorous tearing. 
being the heavens are torn up open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and then a voice came from heaven and said you are my son whom I love with whom I am well pleased so Mark opens up and there you have Jesus in the waters of Jordan and the heavens are torn apart and the Holy Spirit comes down and the voice says this is my son now go to Mark chapter 15 Mark has 16 chapters I know this is toward the end Mark 15 and verse 38. After Jesus is arrested, he's tried, he, he dies, and there's some strange things that happen at his death on the land. When I mean, you look at Mark 15, 33, at noon, when the sun should be as brightest, Darkness came over the whole land till three in the afternoon. It'd be very eerie. And at three in the afternoon, he cries out, uh, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And skipping down, look at verse 38. So verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And then you have immediately following verse 38. The curtain or veil of the temple, curtain of the temple, was torn in two. That's the only place that verb is used again that we saw in Mark chapter 1, verse 10. And it's a, it's a vivid tearing. It was torn in two from top to bottom. And the veil, by the way, or the curtain was not some thin, flimsy veil. Um, tr Jewish tradition says it was as wide as, as your hand or as thick as your hand. So this big, huge, heavy curtain there some force tears that from top to bottom. It's torn. It's the same verb as in Mark 1, the heavens are torn. Now in Mark chapter 1, when the heavens are torn, the voice says, this is my son. Here, when the curtain is torn, look at verse 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. And what kind of confession that is coming from a Roman centurion, I don't know. But Mark is presenting it here. He's saying this man, is, this man recognizes the person who died is, is not like me. But it's tied in again with this tearing, it's the next verse, with this tearing of the veil. Now all that, I think, goes back to Isaiah 64 verse 1 where Isaiah says, or the, the watchman says, oh, that you would tear the heavens and come down. And the good news is God did tear the heavens and, did, and God did come down. And he came down in Christ, in Messiah. And he came down and he identified with our sins, though not having sin, in the waters of baptism there. And he died for our sins, though he, had no, he himself had no sins. And so God came down in Christ. That's answering that plea all those thousands of years before. And we're going to sing an invitation song. It's 207. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus calling. If you're not a Christian this morning, God came down. God became flesh. And he died for your sins. He did something you couldn't do. And in the New Testament, when people hear that, they ask the question, what should I do? How do I respond to this? Do I just go on my way and say, well, that's nice. No, you have illustration, you have examples that when this is taught, when this is preached, people say, what must I do? What should I do? And the ancient preachers, and it's not something I made up, the ancient preachers say, you turn away from sin. You repent, confess the name of Jesus, and you die to sin and you're buried, you're baptized, you're immersed, and you're raised up to walk in a new life. If you've done that and you're not living the way you should be living, you need to know God came down and God um, sent his son to die for you. And he calls you back to faithfulness. And he calls you to turn back to him. So it's our prayer. If you need to come, you'll do that as we stand and sing this song.